my name is Allison. I'm the Programs, Outreach, and Youth Services Manager here at Monterey County Free Libraries. Thank you for joining me for part three of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. Last week, we read a little bit more about Ichabod Crane and his belief in superstitious and supernatural elements. We were also introduced to the character of Katrina Van Tassel and found that Ichabod Crane was now vying for her affection after seeing how rich and well off her family was and seeing the farm, all the livestock, all the fields, the nice house they had. And we were just about to get in to some of the other countrymen who are vying for Katrina's affection. Among these, the most formidable was a burly, roaring, roisterous blade of the name of Abraham, or according to the Dutch abbreviation, Brom, Van Brunt, the hero of the country round, which rang with his feasts of strength and hardihood. He was broad-shouldered and double-jointed, with short, curly black hair and a bluff but not unpleasant countenance, having a mingled air of fun and arrogance. From his Herculean frame and great powers of limb, he had received the nickname of Brom Bones, by which he was universally known. He was famed for great knowledge and skill in horsemanship, being as dexterous on horseback as Tartar. He was foremost at all races and cockfights, and with the ascendancy which bodily strength acquires in rustic life, was the umpire in all disputes, settling his hat on one side and giving his decisions with an air and tone admitting of no gainsay or appeal. He was always ready for either a fight or a frolic, and had more mischief than ill will in his composition. And with all this overbearing roughness, there was a strong dash of waggish good humor at bottom. He had three or four boon companions who regarded him as their model, and at the head of whom he scoured the country, attending every scene of feud or merriment for miles around. In cold weather, he was distinguished by a fur cap surmounted with a flaunting foxtail, when the folks at the country gathering described this well-known crest at a distance, whisking about among a squad of hard riders, they always stood by for a squall. Sometimes his crew would be heard dashing along past the farmhouses at midnight with hoop and hollow like a troop of Don Cossacks, and the old dames startled out of their sleep would listen for a moment till the hurry scurry had clattered by and then exclaim, aye, there goes Brom Bones and his gang. The neighbors looked upon him with a mixture of awe, admiration, and goodwill, and when any madcap prank or rustic brawl occurred in the vicinity, always shook their heads and warranted Brom Bones was at the bottom of it. This rantipole hero had for some time singled out the blooming Katrina for the object of his uncouth gallantries, and though his amorous toyings were something like the gentle caresses and endearments of a bear, yet it was whispered that she did not altogether discourage his hopes. Certain it is his advances were signals for rival candidates to retire who felt no inclination to cross a lion in his armors, insomuch that when his horse was seen tied to Van Tassel's palling on a Sunday night, a sure sign that his master was courting, or as it is termed, sparking within, all other suitors passed by in despair and carried the war into other quarters. Such was the formidable rival with whom Ichabod Crane had to contend, and considering all things a stouter man than he would have shrunk from the competition, and a wiser man would have despaired. He had, however, a happy mixture of pliability and perseverance in his nature. He was in form and spirit like a supple jack, yielding but tough, though he bent he never broke, and though he bowed beneath the slightest pressure, yet the moment it was away, jerk, he was as erect and carried his head as high as ever." To have taken the field openly against his rival would have been madness, for he was not a man to be thwarted in his amours any more than that stormy lover Achilles. Ichabod, therefore, made his advances in a quiet and gently insinuating manner. Under cover of his character of singing master, he made frequent visits to the farmhouse. Not that he had anything to apprehend from the meddlesome interference of parents, which is so often a stumbling block in the path of lovers. Balt Van Tassel was an easy, indulgent soul. He loved his daughter better even than his pipe, and like a reasonable man and an excellent father, let her have her way in everything. His notable little wife, too, had enough to do to attend to her housekeeping and manage her poultry, for, for as she savagely observed, ducks and geese are foolish things and must be looked after, but girls can take care of themselves. Thus, while the busy dame bustled about the house or piled her spinning wheel at one end of the piazza, 
Honest Bolt would sit smoking his evening pipe at the other, watching the achievements of a little wooden warrior who, armed with a sword in each hand, was most valiantly fighting the wind on the pinnacle of the barn. In the meantime, Ichabod would carry on his suit with the daughter by the side of the spring under the great elm, or sauntering along in the twilight that hour so favorable to the lover's eloquence. I profess not to know how women's hearts are wooed and won. To me, they have always been matters of riddle and admiration. Some seem to have but one vulnerable point or door of access, while others have a thousand avenues and may be captured in a thousand different ways. It is a great triumph of skill to gain the former, but a still greater proof of generalship to maintain possession of the latter. For a man must battle for his fortress at every door and window. He who wins a thousand common hearts is therefore entitled to some renown, but he who keeps undisputed sway over the heart of a coquette is indeed a hero. Certain it is this was not the case with the redoubtable Brom Bones, and from the moment Ichabod Crane made his advances, the interest of the former evidently declined. His horse was no longer seen tied to the Paulines on Sunday nights, and a deadly feud gradually arose between him and the preceptor of Sleepy Hollow. Brom, who had a degree of rough chivalry in his nature, would fain have carried matters to open warfare, and have settled their pretensions to the lady according to the mode of those most concise and simple reasoners, the knight-errant of yore, by single combat. But Ichabod was too conscious of the superior might of his adversary to enter the lists against him. He had overheard a boast of bones that he would double the schoolmaster up and lay him on a shelf of his own schoolhouse, and he was too wary to give him an opportunity. There was something extremely provoking in his pacific system. It left Brom no alternative but to draw upon the funds of rustic waggery in his disposition and to play off boorish practical jokes upon his rival. Ichabod became the object of whimsical persecutions to Bones and his gang of rough riders. They harried his hitherto peaceful domains, smoked out his singing school by stopping up the chimney, broke into the schoolhouse at night in spite of its formidable fastenings of width and window stakes, and turned everything topsy-turvy, so that the poor schoolmaster began to think all the witches in the country held their meetings there. But what was still more annoying, Brom took all opportunities of turning him into ridicule in the presence of his mistress and had a scoundrel dog whom he taught to whine in the most ludicrous manner and introduced as a rival of Ichabod's to instruct her in song. In this way, matters went on for some time without producing any material effect on the relative situation of the contending powers. Of a fine autumnal afternoon, Ichabod, in pensive mood, sat enthroned in the lofty stool whence he usually watched all the concerns of his little literary realm. In his hand he swayed a furel, that scepter of despotic power. The birch of justice reposed on three nails behind the throne, a constant terror to evildoers. While on the desk before him might be seen sundry contraband articles and prohibited weapons detected upon the persons of idle urchins, such as the half-munched apples, pop guns, whirligigs, fly cages, and whole legions of rampant little paper gamecocks. Apparently there had been some appalling act of justice recently inflicted, for his scholars were all busily intent upon their books, or slightly whispering behind them, with one eye kept upon the master, and a kind of buzzing stillness reigned throughout the schoolroom. It was suddenly interrupted by the appearance of a man in toe-cloth jacket and trousers, and round-crowned fragment of a hat like the cap of Mercury, and mounted on the back of a ragged, wild, half-broken colt, which he managed with a rope by way of halter. He came clattering up to the school door with an invitation to Ichabod to attend a merry-making or quilting frolic to be held that evening at Van Tassel's. And having delivered his message with that air of importance and effort of fine language, he dashed over the brook and was seen scampering away up the hollow full of importance and hurry of his mission. All was now bustle and hubbub in the late quiet schoolroom. The scholars were hurried through their lessons without stopping at trifles. Those who were nimble skipped over half with impunity, and those who were tardy had a smart application now and then in the rear to quicken their speed or help them over a tall word. Books were flung aside without being put away on the shelves, inkstands were overturned, benches thrown down, and the whole school was turned loose an hour before the usual time, bursting forth like a legion of young imps, yelping and racketing about the green in joy of their early emancipation. The gallant Ichabod now spent at least an extra half hour at his toilet, brushing and fur-brushing up his best, 
and indeed only suit of rustic black and arranging his looks by a bit of broken looking glass that hung up in the schoolhouse. That he might make his appearance before his mistress in the true style of a cavalier, he borrowed a horse from the farmer with whom he lived and thus gallantly mounted issued forth like a knight errant in quest of adventures. But it is meet I should, in the true spirit of romantic story, give some account of the looks and equipments of my hero and his steed. The animal he bestrode was a broken down plow horse that had outlived almost everything but his viciousness. He was gaunt and shagged with an ewe neck and a head like a hammer. His rusty mane and tail were tangled and knotted with burrs. One eye had lost its pupil and was glaring and spectral, but the other had the gleam of a genuine devil in it. Still, he must have had fire and metal in his day, if we may judge from the name he bore of gunpowder. He had, in fact, been a favorite steed of his master's, Van Ripper, who was a furious rider and had infused very probably some of his own spirit into the animal. For old and broken down as he looked, there were more of a lurking devil in him than in any young filly in the country. Ichabod was a suitable figure for such a steed. He rode with short stirrups, which brought his knees nearly up to the pommel of the saddle, his sharp elbows stuck out like grasshoppers. He carried his whip perpendicularly in his hand like a scepter. And as his horse jogged on the motion of his arms was not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings. A small wool hat rested on the top of his nose for so his scanty strip of forehead might be called and the skirts of his black coat fluttered out almost to his horse's tail. Such was the appearance of Ichabod and his steed as they shambled out of the gate of Hans von Ripper and it was altogether such an apparition, apparition as is seldom to be met with in broad daylight. It was, as I have said, a fine autumnal day. The sky was clear and serene, and nature wore that rich and golden livery which we always associate with the idea of abundance. The forests had put on their sober brown and yellow, while some trees of the tenderer kind had been nipped by the frosts into brilliant dyes of orange, purple, and scarlet. Streaming files of wild ducks began to make their appearance high in the air, the bark of the squirrel might be heard from the groves of beech and hickory nuts, and the pensive whistle of the quail at intervals from the neighboring stubble field. The small birds were taking their farewell banquets in the fullness of their revelry. They fluttered, chippering and frolicking from bush to bush and tree to tree, capricious from the very profusion and variety around them. There was the honest cock robin, the favorite game of stripling sportsmen, with its loud querulous note and the twittering blackbirds flying in sable clouds, and the golden-winged woodpecker with his crimson chest, his broad black gorget, and splendid plumage, and the cedar bird with its red-tipped wings and yellow-tipped tail, and its little Monterio cap of feathers, and the blue jay with noisy coxcomb in his gay light blue coat and white underclothes, screaming and chattering, nodding and bobbing and bowing, and pretending to be on good terms with every songster of the grove. That's it for part three. Join me next week for part four of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving.